Good afternoon and welcome to Simpac Live, where the rubber meets the road. I'm your host, Jeff Matthews, and today I'll be interviewing Paul Hodgson, who is the chairman of the Queensland Manufacturing Institute. Paul, until very recently, has also been the interim CEO of the Scaling Green Hydrogen CRC. He is still on the advisory board. Prior to Paul being in both of those roles, he represented the National Energy Resources Australia, that is the NERA, on the east coast of Australia, where he worked with stakeholders to realise the NERA's vision of Australia as a global energy powerhouse. Paul, welcome. Hi Jeff, how are you? I'm very good. Thank you for joining me on Simpac Live. Paul, firstly, Queensland Manufacturing. You're the man with the finger on the pulse. What's happening out there and what's happening especially in the world of sustainability and especially in decarbonisation and, um, and where the world is needing to go and these new technologies? Uh, uh, you, give, give us a, a, lay, a lay of the land. Well, look, uh, look, where do you start, Jeff? Look, I've been working in sustainability for probably a couple of decades, but it's really the last year or so. And I think the real drive globally net zero, the sort of agreement to do net zero has really uh, excited a lot of people and kind of really given a definite direction for where a lot of this is happening. Um, and manufacturing is right at the centre. We saw through the intensity of the pandemic how global supply chains were quite precarious. Um, and there is a, uh, uh, we're starting to hear things like sovereign manufacturing and local capability. Uh, people realising that having a thousand components uh, spread across the world um, and you can only finish your product if you actually have every one of those thousand in place becomes a real risk. Um, and so there's a lot happening. Uh, there's a lot still to happen, but the opportunity for sustainable manufacturing is probably greater than it's ever been, I think. And in Queensland, especially, um, access to renewable resources, you know, almost limitless uh, energy from the sun. You got plenty of space and there's plenty of sun. Um, but also critical minerals uh, um, in the ground that we need for this energy transition, uh, for for batteries and for solar panels and just about everything. We need we need what's in the, in the in the ground in Queensland. So, are you seeing even the, the mining companies starting to move that way in remote mines and, and looking to solar and, and batteries and things? Oh, absolutely. Um, look, Australia is a really, really big country. I, um, it's always, even though I've lived here for about 40 years, I still marvel at how big it is, right? Um, you know, it, it, from Brisbane to Perth, it takes you six hours to fly it um, yeah. in, a, in a big commercial airliner. And I think uh, there is that sense that uh, it's building the supply chain. So Australia obviously is rich with minerals. Um, it's been a big part of our export performance um, in iron ore, um, in copper, um, in a whole aluminium and, and bauxite and a whole range of other minerals. Uh, we have a lot here that can be used and using it uh, for domestic manufacturing, using it for international manufacturing is really important. And the scale of what we're looking to do is, is really significant. Energy is a massive, massive global industry. It really underpins pretty much everything that we do. Um, without energy, there's not much going on. Uh, you can't drive your car, you can't get food to market. Um, it, it, it's, it really is fundamental. So if you're looking at decarbonizing that energy, uh, you're going to require a lot of minerals, you're going to require a lot of product, um, and that product is also going to have to be recycled. It's going to have to be reused. Um, it creates a massive, massive economic challenge, but also a massive economic opportunity. And places like Australia and places like Queensland that have got significant renewable energy, significant minerals, but a great manufacturing capability, great research and technology industry, uh, fantastic education and training, um, and a lot of infrastructure in place. Um, it really is uh, an opportunity that's almost limited by the imagination. And and Paul, you you were you had a uh, had a master's in sustainability over twenty years ago. Um, that was that was really at the had the cutting edge at the forefront back then. I mean, you must have been you've been following this longer than the average person, um, and it may not have come in. You know, certainly, you know, uh, industrial sustainability didn't really come into my consciousness until much later. I, back in those days, I was sort of more into um, wildlife and, and bird protection and things and conservation. Um, 
that 20 years you've seen, it, 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 it must be accelerating, and it must be accelerating at weights that, that are breathtaking to you even. Um, it has. I think it, there was a period, uh, probably around the GFC, to be honest, um, uh, around the 2007, 2008, um, I think a lot of it really uh, was almost put on hold a little bit. I, w I finished my uh, Master's in Sustainable Development at Central Queensland University in 2004, um, and I set up an innovation and sustainability consulting business. I did so quite a bit in the clean tech space. Um, and looking at those supply chains, I did a venture capital mapping project on clean technology for the Queensland government and a range of things. But it's really only now, I think, where a lot of it's coming together because the demand is starting to be there or the need is being there in terms of meeting global and national and corporate and regional uh, net zero uh, outcomes. And um, no one really knows how to get there. Um, it's kind of scary, but for people who are entrepreneurial, who are people who are willing to be courageous and to lead and to invest, um, the opportunities, you know, for your business, for your region, for your career are, um, are, are amazing. They really are. Um, so it has been moving along slowly at times and fast at other times. But now what it requires is, is a lot of people rolling up the sleeves and doing things and doing things together to build out that supply chain, to make sure there's value across that, uh, that supply chain so that people uh, are incentivized to work together and to, and to deliver that impact that we need. Yes, yes. Um, and uh, years ago... Um for the New Zealand Hydrogen Council, I wrote a tagline, um, uh, and, and it was innovation through collaboration. Because when when I looked at hydrogen back in those days, it, it was like nobody was going to do it alone. Nobody was going to go alone, <laughs> you know. And and until uh, probably until that point, what what I've sort of discovered is there were lots of companies trying to develop things and patent them and hold them very tight, and have uh, you know uh, you know complete the circle themselves almost. But now you're looking at these big circles, these big uh, lifetime circles of product circles, and no one's got all, no one's holding everything, no one's holding all the cards. It's impossible, and um, and so you need that co collaboration. Uh, you know how much uh, your work in the Queensland Manufacturing Institute? How much uh, uh, collaboration work do you do? Do you bring parties together? Do you see one thing over here and see another thing over there, and do you try and put them together? What you know, if somebody's um, yeah, is that is that a, a, a big bit of your job or, or, or a chunk of your job? No, oh, absolutely. I mean, Queensland Manufacturing Institute was set up 30 years ago. Uh, it's its 30, 30 year anniversary this year, um, and it was set up as a collaboration between uh, uh, CSIRO, QUT, uh, the Queensland Government through Skills Tech, um, and uh, it has been very much about bringing people together, bringing technology to people, um, bringing uh, uh, apprentices through. Um, and exciting. Even now, we have a gateway industry skills program into, uh, which is funded by the Queensland government in advanced manufacturing, working with fifty plus schools to to bring talent and to excite people about a career in manufacturing. Um, so very much uh, that's been a big part of what we do um, on major projects. Uh, the industry capability network, which is a national network, and in fact also includes New Zealand. Um, we uh, have Industry Capability Network Queensland, so we're a big part of that network and it's about you know, 80,000 suppliers across the country and how they can get involved, how they can work together, how they can build their capability, how they can be ready uh, for uh, those requests for tenders that come through uh, the system um, as well. So what we want to do is we want to maximise local manufacturing, but we also see that a lot of manufacturing components is going to be required uh, to decarbonise Australia and to decarbonise uh, export markets uh, from Australia as well. Um, uh, a figure that I, I love is uh, the International Energy Agency, I think two years ago, um, uh, uh, projected that by 2050 we would need about, uh, the world would need something like about another $40, billion, uh, $40 trillion dollars of battery packs, wind towers, fuel cells, solar panels, and electrolyzers. Um, these are massive, and, massive numbers. Yes, and and this year they predicted another thirty million jobs before two thousand and thirty. That's right. And, and 30, 30 million jobs before two thousand thirty. So um, it, it's a it, it, it's a big chunk. Um, and 
one of the things about uh, true leadership is is um, you don't you know uh, leaders and you've seen them entrepreneurs also you know um, and, and and sometimes leadership and entrepreneurs are so, so intermixed you couldn't you couldn't um, divide them. You know, getting out of bed trying to do something because they think it's the right thing to do. Yes, it might lead to good monetization down the road, but they tend not to sit back and wait for government subsidies or, or tax breaks or something like this. They get on and, and do it. Um, how much are you seeing that leadership coming through with Queensland manufacturers? And and, this, and, well, I, and I, manufacturing to me is everything that's not cottage industry. And so, and, and it includes all parts of that circular economy, from from mining through to through to recycling and repurposing and refurbishment, uh, um, and waste as well. Uh, look, there are. Uh, I mean, I've worked with manufacturing, uh, particularly in Queensland, but also nationally, all my career, um, and it always astounds me. Um, and I'm delighted by the quality of manufacturing, the export markets that get built the domestic markets, the, uh, the entrepreneurship that happens in manufacturing. It's often a sector uh, that gets a bad rap. Um, it's often seen as a, you know, Australia can't compete in manufacturing. Um, Australia, uh, you know, is, is reducing its manufacturing performance. Um, but there are, you know, there are fantastic examples of clever manufacturers everywhere. The challenge we often find is, you know, you talked about the micro cottage kind of industries um, once you get up to a certain size, how do we keep them here? And how do we, uh, as you grow through a business life cycle, you need different things at different points of that life cycle. Uh, and so how do we kind of keep, I guess, flexible with the support and the ecosystem we build around those companies so that they can continue to grow and grow and grow um, and they don't kind of either peter out um, or they get, uh, they get moved, uh, moved somewhere else and you lose that, that, that local impact. Um, but there, there are, there are, Countless companies uh, attracting venture capital, attracting other capital, uh, winning export awards, uh, winning new markets, developing new products, uh, growing their workforce um, in, in Queensland. And a lot of them now, uh, even increasing numbers, are very much doing it in that sustainable uh, way uh, around sustainability. It may be that they're in energy or they're in waste or something, but if but any manufacturer can be looking at uh, how energy efficient uh, their products are, um, are they built for the circular economy? So rather than just a uh, make uh, uh, and waste, uh, make, use and waste kind of approach, um, how do they build that in? How do they build that in so it's not a disposable product? Um, and that changes the business model. So there's people doing that right across manufacturing in Queensland now. Um, and I think what we can do is aggregate those opportunities and integrate them a little bit better so that they're, they're hunting as a pack, they're working together, um, and they're building uh, multiple strengths into a really solid uh, consortium that delivers an integrated solution for markets, both in Australia and overseas. Yeah, I, I, I love that term you just used, hunting as a pack. I'm, I'm going to bank that one in, my, in the back of my head, uh, Paul, and credit you at some stage with that, because I, that, that, that's, what I, that, that's what I think it is. It's, it's to get you know, rubber on the road, it's to get traction in that. It, it, it's, it's much better when you've got um, uh, you know, more numbers, more brain power, more uh, backing behind you to, to be able to do things. That collaboration, that hunting in a pack is going, going to be important. And because... I'm also, uh, you know, I, I, I've connected globally as we most are, and, and I know you are through 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 um, LinkedIn and, and your other channels. And I saw a, a program the other day you know, come out of Germany. It was a TV program, and it was about um, making uh, green steel in Germany with with hydrogen. And um, and we're all we're all looking. You know, we know it's a hard to debate sector, and we know hydrogen's the only way they're going to um, uh, decarbonise that industry. And um, and then you had the manufacturer at the end, the owner of the steel plant, saying, well, we, you know, we'll need lots of hydrogen. We'll have to import it from countries like Australia. And I, I looked at it and thought, well, hang on, you're going to import iron ore from either Africa or Australia, but, you know, um, and you want to import the energy, the hydrogen all the way. It's like, well, why not make it in Australia? You know, it's just it, it, exporting both the energy and the ore all the way to Germany to put it together as, as steel doesn't, doesn't make sense. And so I, the, the more I look at Australia's energy resources and its mining resources, it, 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 it's, it's, it's common sense that you've got to, your industry starts there, your foundation, and then how much more you add to it is um, 
it is uh, it, it, that's going to be um, you know jobs export dollars and underpinning all that that the access to really cheap renewable energy i.e. energy that's costing you nothing because um, it just costs you some capital um, there are other countries in the world it's going to cost a significant amount and that's going to change the old economic paradigms and that means you know the old economic paradigms built around um, cheap fossil fuels and so and I, I use the example of um, operating instead of operating one machine 24 7 operating two 12 hours a day but going really hard with them because that energy is free so the old economic paradigms built up under fossil fuels are going to go out the door and the more you look at the new economic paradigms the more you can believe in this vision of australia being the industrial superpower of a decarbonized world and um yeah so uh um and, and so co co coming back to the next question you know is there i don't see a limit to what uh, Australia can do in the in this sector in a decarbonized manufacturing world. I, I, I don't I don't say oh we give up we haven't got this you know. No, well, and that's right. I mean, and that's why I think a lot of it is is limited by uh, the imagination and and the leadership and the courage. Um, you talked about iron ore. Um, that's already been worked. That's already been. Uh, considered right that uh, it doesn't make necessarily a lot of sense to ship hydrogen uh, to say somewhere like Korea and iron ore um, what you might do is look at combining the hydrogen and the iron ore here creating an iron briquette um, and then sending it to Korea for the further steel making or doing steel here and doing more steel here uh, people like Professor Ross Garno um, if anyone's read his book Superpower and I think he's got a new book as well and he's just set up the Superpower Institute um, is very bullish on Australia's ability to produce more aluminium here and more steel, um, and which we used to do a lot on the back of baseload, uh, cheap baseload coal, um, to uh, to actually regain some of that here, um, but to do it as part of a global world. So it will always make sense to do some parts in market or closer to market. Uh, there will be other strengths and other uh, unique. Uh, 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 opportunities around the world uh, so we do need to think about Australia but we also do need to think about it in a global context and there's nothing wrong with an Australian manufacturer making some parts of their products in other places um, if you want to be in various markets around the world you may have a European manufacturing uh, base you may have a, a, a Northeast Asian manufacturing base you may have a North American manufacturing base uh, you may be supplying, uh, receiving certain supplies from different parts of the world. Uh, that's how the manufacturing sector works. Um, it doesn't all have to be done here, but certainly we could do a lot more here. Um, so changing that paradigm is really important. I mean, Jeff, we live in an age now where manufacturers can produce their own energy. Yes. Right? Um, they can put solar panels on the roof. Um, they can even do distributed wind. Um, there's even printed solar now they can do. Uh, they could be potentially producing their own, uh, uh, charging up their own transport vehicles um, uh, uh, with uh, EVs, or they could be producing hydrogen with electro uh, electrolyzer on site. Um, yep. And then they could even take it further. And um, so there's some really clever things that I think we can do. I think we're moving to a much more distributed model, um, and that actually creates independence and it creates entrepreneurial opportunities as well. Yes. Um, and they and they can also uh by using demand side response they can also um not only save themselves money but also uh provide uh, grid services as well for 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 the grid when it when it needs it so um right. and, and and a lot of that demand side response as you, as you know paul uh, it, it's one of it's one of my favorite su subjects i've lectured on uh, around the world comes at no cost. In fact, that's why it's not sexy. It's not sexy because no one's figured out how to monetize it because most of it's just common sense. <laughs> most of it's, oh, we'll just make a bit more now and a bit less later or we'll switch this off or we'll turn that down. And um, But being able to use, go up in energy it, it, when, it, when it's free and plentiful and you're generating your own, as you said, and to be able to that flexibility of production that's that's the change in economic paradigms that, that that that's going to open up the possibilities of manufacturers having their own and doing certain stuff with it. So yeah, talking about it, that, it, yeah, sorry, go. Sorry, I was just going to say. So you know, I mean, and that's the same at the domestic level, right? So we've got solar panels on our roof. We've had solar panels on our roof for maybe four or five years. 
um, you know, it's changed uh, the way we operate our house, right? I'm yes. uh, uh, more likely to put the dishwasher on after breakfast than after dinner, right? Yes. You know, because you, uh, you're you generating, uh, on a day like today in Brisbane, you're generating huge amounts of uh, solar energy. Um, it makes much sense to use it when it's when it's being generated, right? Uh, then yes. to buy it back from the grid at a more expensive plot time when the sun's not shining um, at 8 o'clock at night. Yes, yes, yes. No, I had a chat to uh, a friend that lives on the Gold Coast, and uh, he went. He's generating a lot off his roof, and uh, he went and changed uh, the timers on his swimming pool pumps and, uh, and the compressors on his on his fridge and stuff, just because it makes common sense. Use it. Don't put it back into the grid when when everyone's trying to and the prices are negative. Use it yourself. Um, yep. So now, and talking about uh, energy flexibility and energy security. Tell me about your role with um, Scaling Green Hydrogen CRC. And, and I'm particularly interested in how you got, and, and for those listening, uh, you've raised, uh, you got committed $160 million from 93 stakeholders, and you're now awaiting, uh, I think it's government approval or government uh, to come up with their bid or, or the, uh, something like that. But also, how you went about it, how you got the rubber on the road. How, you know, I, I look at people like you and I think, God, you must be clever. How did you go about it? Was it shoe leather or talking to people on the phone? Just take us through that. Um, it's probably, look, I mean, really clever team um, and working uh, collaboratively. But what we, I, I took on the role as interim CEO. I was invited to late in 2021. Um, and around about this time, I'd been working in Hydrogen for a few years uh, at NERA. Uh, we developed up a Hydrogen cluster network. Um, but what was changing in the hydrogen space was less of an emphasis on gas, uh, which is actually how we produce hydrogen and use hydrogen now predominantly, and, and into what was called green hydrogen. And green hydrogen um, is not a, not a new process. Electrolysis, as, uh, uh, as a, a Rye engineer once told me, was too, too wise in some water. Um, but to do it at scale, it's a little bit more complex than that, right? Um, and so we, we went, well, the uh, if we look across the hydrogen landscape, there was lots of little projects. And we kind of went, at some point, those projects are going to stall or they're going to start competing with each other for unless we build the foundations for the sector. So what we did was we backcast. Um, and I think this always works well in collaboration, is that you backcast and you come up with a very large vision that people see themselves in and see how it will benefit themselves. If we went... Here's our CRC. We'd like to raise a certain amount of money so that we can spend that money on research. Um, people would go, well, that doesn't sound very exciting. I don't really want to be part of it. But what we said was we envisaged by 2040, Australia would need a terawatt of electrolysis. Um, and how much would that be in renewables? How much would that be in water? How much technology would be required? Uh, what the workforce would be look like? Um, and it's really what I would call the foundations. So if I'm just doing a project and I want to build a 500 megawatt electrolyzer, um, but eventually I might like to have, you know, 10 gigawatts or 20 gigawatts and maybe distributed, um, I'm going to come up against uh, the supply of technology. I'm going to come up against regulatory barriers. I'm going to come up against social license. Um, who, where are the people going to be operating this or, or maintaining it for me or using it for me? What skills are they going to require? Um, where's the water going to come from? Am I going to be connected to the grid? And if I'm connected to the grid, it's not going to be green. It's going to be a mix of green and, uh, and fossil fuels, uh, at least in Australia. Um, and, and who's looking after all that shared infrastructure? So if I'm going to need water, who's doing the water infrastructure? Who's doing the electricity? Um, do I have to pay for that? Does it make sense for me to pay for it if I've got uh, eight or nine different neighbours that all want to do uh, hydrogen as well? Uh, maybe we should get together and share that. Um, and what that does require is a lot of new relationships and new consortia uh, to come together. So um, we we iterated very much with industry, with research, with government, with community. Um, all through 2022, we, we uh, I spoke at lots of conferences. I attended lots of conferences. We did lots of webinars, lots of face-to-face -face and online meetings, probably hundreds if not thousands uh, we had a database of about 1,500 people that we were working with um, to really work out how do we put the supply chain together. If these are building blocks for building a strong supply chain, uh, that's, uh, you know, with customers, with suppliers, with enablers, uh, with regulators, with uh, looking at the different policy options, looking at mining companies, 
uh, looking at all sorts of different things. How do we put all that together? Um, and how do we bring this diverse consortium together? And as you said, we ended up with 93 industry part- oh, 93 partners, um, 18 university partners, and I think 75 uh, industry partners and government partners, um, and who pledged $160 million of cash and in kind for a 10-year program. Uh, we're now at the stage where we're waiting for the Australian government to shortlist to stage two. Um, and uh, hopefully we will be shortlisted. Um, our ask for the Australian government is $50 million um, to add into that mix so that we would have $210 million at least over a 10-year period to do real projects uh, to connect up that supply chain um, and to build the skills and to build the, uh, the manufacturing capability as well. Uh, so it's a big ambitious task, but I think um, if you raise your ambition, you raise the vision, uh, you have a, a, a sense that lots of people can see themselves in it and can see where they're going to benefit, uh, then you do build a collaboration. Uh, if you set the bar low, um, it looks transactional, it looks very insular, uh, but if you set the bar high, um, you, uh, you've, got more, you've got more people that want to come along for the ride and want to contribute. Mm. Oh, look, congratulations! You you set the bar high, and it, it's a, it, it, it's fantastic, and uh, and and I'm sure it's uh, it's going to get uh, tick off from the Australian government and move you to the, to the next phase, and we and we look forward to it. The just before we we go, Paula, um, hydrogen debate it's it, it's heating up around uh, around the world. Um, I recently did my own podcast, and I had a particular. Um, uh, aspect of the export of hydrogen, and and I've said in, um, that I think it'll it'll be eighty percent consumed domestically and about twenty percent left over for an export trade, and I've linked that to dairy product because that that's globally what happens with dairy product, and dairy is made from the same thing as hydrogen. It's it's water and sunlight and uh, goes through a cow, and but it's equally as difficult when it comes out the other end. It's it's heavy and it's liquid and it goes off, and and so um, so. And I, I, I then I, I then said, oh well, I think it'll be exported in green ammonia. And I've since had my mind um, persuaded that methanol's um, maybe um, a preferred carrier, especially for the um, uh, marine sector. But also, so we're, we're seeing this debate about how to keep it and store it. Um, is it going to be in in, in limestone uh, or, or in, in caverns, uh, salt caverns? Is it going to be in um, liquid and cryogenic form? Is it going to be compressed? Is it going to be um, turned into green ammonia, methanol? But we're also seeing in a debate emerging in Europe of um, uh, heat pumps versus hydrogen. And um, there's a lot of that uh, talk in the EU with, with a lot of people saying it, it, it's no point mixing it into the gas. It, that's the last thing you'd... We've had a rejection of a trial project in the UK wanting to put households on hydrogen, and um, and heat pumps uh, and the heat pump advocates are saying don't even think about household heating. You know, a heat pump's more efficient. I I I I look at it and I go, the market will sort that out eventually. People will find it or find its own equilibrium. And I said that we won't get to decarbonisation without hydrogen. We can't because those big heavy industries. They've got no other options, you know, because um, high temp heat is difficult to attain without burning fossil fuels. You're, you're left with hydrogen. So, what's your what's your what's your read currently at the moment, this moment in time, knowing that you know these these, these things? Are, can you can you add to that debate or or, or or give us your opinion on it? Yeah, sure. I look, it's a great it's a great question, Jeff, and it's a real love of mine actually, because I mean one of the the important things we brought to the Scaling Green Hydrogen CRC was a pragmatic sense, as you've said, which is hydrogen's going to be required somewhere, right? Hydrogen's already produced. It's it's about 100 million tonnes a year it's used, and it's used in chemicals. It's used in fertilisers predominantly, but it's also used in refining, petrochemical refining. Um, um, I think it's about 100 million. I think it's 660,000 tonnes, I think, we produce in Australia each year of hydrogen. But it all comes from methane, through steam methane reformation. Um, one of the, um, the things I think is really important is that we go, there's this massive issue that we're trying to do, which is to get to net zero. We're trying to arrest and we're trying to slow and hopefully arrest uh, the, the ravages of climate change, uh, of which we can only really predict uh, how, how bad that could get uh, for humanity. I mean, the Earth will be fine. It'll, it'll throw us off. Um, 
or it'll uh, uh, it'll it'll survive. But but for us, um, you know, it's a it's an existential issue, and so you don't throw anything off the table. Um, you don't throw any potential solutions off the table. And I think you also have sympathy for some people who might might actually want to use what they've currently got and reuse it for a new purpose. You know, there's 10 billion internal combustion engines in the world. Um, I've been to places like Moda Valley in Italy uh, last year. Um, There is uh, the technology, the factories uh, that's been built over decades and decades and decades of skills and capabilities and regional economic development and, uh, you know, revenue and everything else. Um, uh, You know, I'm not going to wag my finger at people who are looking at uh, renewable fuels to put through an internal combustion engine. Um, it makes sense if you've got gas pipelines, if you've got gas plants, you've got gas infrastructure. Um, sure, look at blending. Um, but I think there will be a mix in the future. And I think uh, there's a natural element to this. You talked about the cost of energy. I think energy efficiency is the first one. If you can reduce your energy consumption, then you do that. Right. Uh, that's that's often the cheapest, perhaps the unsexiest way of doing it. Um, but you know, you, you lose it or, or, or you do your demand response or you shift when you produce or when you use your energy um, to actually make sense. Um, then in a place like Australia, where we get 58 million petajoules of solar radiation each year, um, and I should I should reference that, that we produce 20,000 petajoules of coal and gas. And we're the largest gas exporter in the world. And I think the second or third largest coal exporter in the world. So 58 million, million petajoules of just of solar, forget wind and other renewable resources. Um, th- we're going to have an advantage in renewables. If we can scale it up, um, it, uh, CSIRO will now tell you that uh, wind and solar with batteries is the cheapest form of electricity production. Um, and um, so electric vehicles are going to make a lot of sense. Uh, my next car will be an electric vehicle. Um, my next car will uh, very unlikely be a fuel cell electric vehicle. But in some markets around the world where they'll be importing their renewables and they don't want to import it through a high voltage DC cable or container ships full of charged up batteries, um, it's likely it's going to be hydrogen or a carrier such as ammonia or methanol. And if that's the case, uh, rather than converting it back to electricity, they may actually want to put it into a into a hydrogen network and fuel up hydrogen fuel cell uh, electric vehicles. Mm. Um, So there'll be there'll be different. Um, there'll be different answers depending on the question in the region, uh, in the application, and even in the season um, as well across the world. And so the mix will be is very unpredictable at this stage. But I think it's clear to me that it's uh, it's not going to be uh, there's not going to be one winner. There's not going to be just electrification. Uh, there's not going to be just hydrogen. Uh, there's not going to be just biofuels. Um, there's not going to be just waste uh, recycling and, and use as heat or, or anything. Um, there's going to be a, a significant mix in the future. Um, mm. And uh, and so we, you know, we came from a view of we don't know what the global market for green hydrogen will look like. Uh, and we uh, we think that you should go for the most efficient, most effective, cheapest, quickest, um, most beneficial, safest uh, model. But where that doesn't work for something else and green hydrogen's the answer we need to scale green hydrogen we need to do it efficiently effectively and for the benefit of uh, of the supply chain um and so you know it's a pragmatic view i think that we have to um and we have to work together and we can't throw solutions off the table um on an on a basis that we you know we we, we like a particular tool yeah we've got to keep very yeah, much no. focused on the outcome and, and- and one of the one of the points I sort of uh, say to the uh, the detractors of hydrogen often like to point out the inefficiency of 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 making it. You lose the energy to make it. But here's the point: is that when we when we start the learning rate of solar and wind, it means it's doubling every solar's I, don't know, I think eighteen months. You know, winds a couple of, a little bit behind it, and it, it means that once we get to a hundred percent of our energy needs. We're only two years away of producing 200%, and we're only four years away of producing 400% of our energy needs. So we will undoubtedly overproduce. 
And so the amount of energy efficiency, if you're taking it from, say, solar in, in Australia, where it's, it's sunny every day and it's, and it's land not used for anything else and it's not, it, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter whether you give 35% or 45% or 75%. Fossil fuels are not very efficient at using it in, 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 before it gets out. So if you take those in, in inefficiencies out, it, it comes down to use, storage, and transportation. And there will be, a, 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 and no one solution is going to win. We need, we, as I say, we'll need everything, every solution you can bring to the table to actually, because if you look at the numbers to get to where we want to go to, to, to stop uh, global warming, we need everything. And, uh, and and on that note, um, uh, Paul, uh, thank you so much. Uh, it was a, a great chat. Um, the listeners, I'm, I'm sure, are going to uh, learn a lot, and um, and I have, and it's been uh, most enjoyable hosting you on the show. Thank you. Fantastic, Jeff. Really uh, enjoyed the conversation. Thank you.